Great. Can you guys hear me down there? Perfect. Beautiful. So before we start the panel, I just want to say what an amazing job that Web Summit has done here in Brazil. So kudos to Brazil, to Web Summit, and everybody involved. It's been an absolute experience being here in Brazil and look forward to the next one next year. But today we're going to be talking about startup success, what external and internal factors are impacting that, and what can you do to build thriving ecosystems and obviously generate the next generation of unicorns. And so today we have an amazing set of panelists. We have Mark from Startup Genome, who is basically advising governments on startup-friendly policies to help build these thriving ecosystems. Then we have um, Jerry from Carta, who is leading one of the fastest growing companies within spend management and expense management systems, but also a former growth executive at many other companies and a CEO founder. Then we had Gina Gothilt. Gothilt? Got milk? Got milk. <laughs> From, uh, from Latitude, the co-founder of Latitude, and she has also pre a previous experience in leading growth and expansion for companies like Duolingo, etc. And so, very, very excited to have them here today. And so, I want to start off today's conversation with Mark. Um, so Mark, I want to jump into the conversation in terms of discussing around what you're doing at Startup Genome. Uh, your organization is arguably one of the leading organizations that are helping other governments and building thriving ecosystems around policy development, etc. So can you share a little bit with the audience around the common challenges you've seen with the extensive work that you've done with organizations from around the world? Sure. Thank you so much, Klaus. So we started as a research project at the time, trying to really understand what it takes for a startup to be successful and to try to understand why so many of them fail. And over time, this knowledge has become extremely useful to government leaders and innovation ecosystem builders in order for them to do a better job at serving the entrepreneurs and the investors and the community, really. And some of the things that we continue to find till this day is that there's a lack of information and lack of data for the policymakers to really understand from the voice of the entrepreneur what it takes to actually build a business and how they can best support them without getting in their way, right? Uh, that's one example, that there are plenty other examples we could talk about. One other example that I'd like to mention is that the best public policy typically flows through the private sector, right? When you think of grants, for example, what does it do for the ecosystem? You basically train the entrepreneurs to be professionals in grant writing, right? Or in proposals for grants. Um, if, you can, if you compare that to really educating high net worth individuals and becoming angel investors and really routing the entrepreneurs to work with more angels in the ecosystem, that's much more sustainable and that really builds the ecosystem, right? So, these are just two examples uh, that we see over and over again. Yeah, I think in particular with a country like Korea, they do a lot of grants and companies can continue to raise money through grants. Yeah. And I don't think it serves the entrepreneurs from a long term perspective because they kind of almost stays like ambers, if you will, just yeah. not really developing into fast growing companies in the marketplace. And so, um, Gina, I want to bring your perspective in as someone that is leading an accelerator latitude. What are some of the common threats and themes that founders are facing when growing in the region? Uh, and what, what can be done to create a better thriving ecosystem to serve the entrepreneurs? Uh, problems that they're facing, is that yeah, one question? Problem. Yes. So I would say that being an entrepreneur in Latin America is very much like being an entrepreneur anywhere else. Uh, it's really hard to start something from scratch. It's really hard to fi make sure that you're focused on the right thing. It's hard to convince others to come along with you, people to quit high paying jobs and join you, or to convince people to give you money to actually fund what you're doing. Those are the problems that entrepreneurs face. So I would say finding product market fit, which means one, making sure that you're actually built, actually able to build something and then prove that people actually want to buy it at scale. Two, fundraising, super tough. And then there's, it's, you know, we have our own difficulties in Latin America just in terms of capital availability. Um, the fact that a lot of the important funds require English um, speaking uh, or you know, do better with English and 3% of the Brazilian population, for example, speaks English. Um, but the problems are very similar. The one that I think that is very particular to LATAM is, in particular uh, Brazil, is you, if you want to raise money from top funds, you often need an offshore because a lot of uh, top funds are, uh, they don't feel confident in investing in a, com in a country like Brazil. And we'll talk about policy soon, but investing in countries in Latin America can be seen like a big risk. Right. And so you need an offshore structure, you need to figure out how to get money to that offshore structure, and all of that is super complicated, and that's what we're building at Latitude. So 
help for companies who need to figure out how to incorporate, how to do that correctly, and how to then receive money, pay people in Brazil, pay people in the US, do FX, be compliant, etc. Fantastic. So let's move in a little bit more over to you, Jerry. You're leading a fast growing company in Latin America. What are some of the challenges that you're seeing fast growing have fast growing companies are having when it, when it comes to keeping the momentum going and growth going in the region? What I can say to that is that I mean for us or you know, having gone through several stages in a cycle and experiences before is that the sense of existential urgency never really goes away. It doesn't go away at all, actually. And it's, you know, at first, you know, just having, uh, you know, a co-founder, you know, someone that you really want to work with to start, uh, you know, having a first prototype or, you know, maybe just a deck or having your first investor on board, uh, you know, kind of that, that same thing continues. I think the only thing that changes is that, you know, the responsibility feels even greater uh, and perhaps you know the existential uh, urgency is something that's like not immediately you know in the next few weeks but more months or years away uh, but th but there's always that that rush right I think at, at the core of it um, and you know one way that we've tried to approach at Clara like being able to sustain uh, high growth high velocity is to you know think a bit ahead of where we are today right think more with the end state in mind and knowing that we need strong foundations at each stage uh, in order to continue having that kind of growth at future stages. I mean, you can think of it a bit as, you know, like building a structure. You know, if you, you know, you have to have solid foundations first to be able to build the next floor and so forth, so on and so forth. Uh, otherwise, you know, it ends up becoming a, a house of cards, right? So we're investing ahead of where we are today, you know, not too far ahead, but definitely ahead in terms of the team that we have in place, the processes that we have in place, you know, taking care of technical debt so that our product is able to scale, you know, thinking about what the product we want is going to look like and not making decisions that are just, you know, going to help us through the next few months, but actually get, help us get to that end state faster. And so uh, that's how you keep the momentum Great. going. Awesome. Thank you. I want to pick a little bit more on you, more specifically around talent. Uh, when we interviewed executives uh, for the book Global Class, 95% of all executives said that talent is the most difficult thing to solve for. Hiring talent, building teams, etc. And so um, one of some of, the, some of the challenges that you've seen is scaling your organization. Just to give you an example, in Korea, as an example, it's very, very hard to fire people. In fact, you actually go, have to go to each in, in, individual employee and almost agree with them to fire them, basically. Culturally, but also regulatory as well. What are some of the things that you've experienced in growing Carta and your region? Are there any specific policies, any specific re and cultural issues that you've experienced in, in relation to talent and hiring? Absolutely. I mean, going back to this idea of building the foundations, like the team is, is it, right? You need to have uh, you know, the, the right team in place. Thinking about the team competition and uh, the only way that you think about a sports team. Um, and you know, one of the challenges that we see is that for a startup, you know, just like with a sports team, uh, sometimes you need to have a different focus, right? Like maybe you need more forwards or, you know, given the composition of the team, someone might not be a great fit and you kind of you need to make some adjustments. Uh, and it's a very dynamic environment, right? So one of the things that we see can be challenging is that may maybe labor policy, for example, can be like pretty inflexible. So in Mexico, for example, uh, the the way that the, you know employment security or se severance is set up, uh, you might uh, have someone on your team that you know if it doesn't work out, you may end up paying much more in severance than the salary that is accrued in the first few months. Which you know we, I think we would all agree with the objective of having a safety net and having security, but there's different ways of getting added, right? Like you can have employment uh, insurance, you know, you can have uh, you know a different version of that, like universal basic income. Uh, but if you put the onus uh, the way it's done now in that case in Mexico, for example, uh, it kind of assumes that there's more like permanent employment rather than a more dynamic labor environment where uh, ultimately it's better for even the people involved where they can find more quickly a, a, a role that's like really ideal for them. Fantastic. I want to move over to Mark right now, more relation to ecosystem development and so forth. And we had a great conversation before jumping on this panel, actually online a couple of weeks ago, where you talked about the policies you need to implement will change over time. Obviously, if you're in the early stages of developing an ecosystem, there are certain policies needed to implement at the very beginning versus later, etc. 
Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of how do you develop an ecosystem over time? I know there's no perfect playbook or no one-size-fits-all solution, but you have a lot of experience. I'm sure. I think you can kind of give us some patterns at the very least. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at one point after studying hundreds of ecosystems around the world, we found that there are common patterns and phases of development that each of them go through. The first phase, we call it activation, right? In the activation phase, you're really trying to activate the ecosystem by means of more talent for the ecosystem, right? You want to have more people that take the leap and start a company. You want to have more early stage investors, angel investors that try investing into tech. And really, that should be the priority and that should be the lens for all of the, for all of the investments that you're making as a community, as a public, uh, as a public entity. And then if you advance in the ecosystem, right, you have hundreds of startups and several of them are already wildly successful, then you want to perhaps look a bit more at the quality component, right? And that's where you see several ecosystems around the world perhaps launching scale-up programs, right? Because it's really difficult for the best companies in your ecosystem that maybe generate 5 million in ARR to get that number up to 100 million, right? And to hire 500 people within six months or something like that. So the challenges for a founder become very different over the course of their startup journey. And therefore, as the ecosystem matures, also the programming to some extent should mature and should also not forget those that are wildly successful because still what we're seeing is that 90% of all public policy investments in innovation policy still goes to the very early stage of company development. And from an economic development point of view, that's a bit of a problem, actually. Let's uh, imagine I put a wand in you guys' hand, all of you guys, and you could go and actually wish, actually, no, magically change something within an ecosystem. You can think about a specific market, a LATAM overall. What are some specific resources or policies that you would like to change if you could? I'd like to agree 100% with Jerry and right. say that it's the same thing in Brazil, like in terms of labor laws. We, our governments try so hard to protect the employees that they create policies that make it so that employers don't want to hire the employees. So in the end, you actually, it doesn't, it doesn't quite work. So right. just to give you an example, uh, my father, who's an entrepreneur, not a tech entrepreneur, had a, a secretary and assistant he, he had for 20 years. Um, he, they worked super well together, and then at the end, she sued him. And he, you know, he was like, why are you suing me? And she said, oh, you know, I, I, I've sued all my previous employers. It, it, it works, because you're very likely to win if you're an employee suing your employer, which is also why most international funds are afraid of investing in a local structure for like Brazil or Mexico, because you just don't understand the liabilities and the, and the labor law ones are particularly complicated. And I know that it sounds like they are helpful, but in fact, they end up hurting the employee because then the employer needs to dance around and figure out what they're going to do to hire less people or to put, you know, structures in place so that they are not at a liability. Jerry? So in, in our space, in, uh, in fintech, uh, I mean, I guess it's, it's no secret that the Brazilian central bank is especially visionary uh, and really an example, not just for the rest of LATAM, but for the world. Uh, you know, there are many speakers. I was... Uh, with one of them earlier who are here from, from the central bank. Um, you know, sometimes, for example, so in, in, there's a specific example in Mexico. Uh, you know, we believe very strongly it's part of our company DNA, and we think that this is where the future is going, that uh, fintech companies, you know, focus much more on the tech component, uh, you know, ought to and can build a lot more by partnering with financial institutions. So. Uh, more recently, uh, the regulators in Mexico have decided that banking as a service, so basically, you know, one of these four ways in which fintechs and financial institutions can collaborate uh, is not permitted. So basically, it requires companies to build much more of the full stack, you know, have full regular, like, you know, kind of the full stack from a regulatory perspective as well, rather than being able to uh, divide and conquer as, you know, is happening much more in Brazil. So. You know, it means that there's, there is ultimately less competition for a player like us that does have more resources to be able to build more of that full stack. Uh, but I think ultimately it ends up having a you know, net worse effect for, for society. Mark, your opinion? I mean, first of all, it's amazing to see that we're all thinking about regulation because this is some of the hardest thing you can actually, or some of the hardest problems you can actually solve. Um, but yeah, I mean, my wish would be along the same lines, I would say. I mean. I would love to make it very easy for entrepreneurs everywhere in the world to issue stock option programs to their employees because I think that has a huge 
upside for talent attraction and in general to create an ecosystem where people have a shared upside and try to change the world together and then perhaps also force pension funds around the world to invest into the VC asset class. That could have a huge impact as well. Yeah, great. Thank you guys. So we have talked about external factors. So the, let's now turn the focus to internal factors. Um, but I would like to stress the importance of global. Right? We see a lot of ecosystems around the world where they're developing a lot of local entrepreneurs. But how can you build a globally thriving ecosystem where you build companies like Carta, like Nubank, etc.? And so I want to turn the focus to you, uh, Gina. Um, your organization, Latitude, is really a catalyst for growing the entrepreneurial ecosystem in LATAM. Uh, and, and what are some of the patterns of success and failures that you've seen with founders that are building and scaling in the region? So again, I think um, building in LATAM is, is similar to building in other parts of the world. Right. Wherever you are, thinking globally is, is the differential. But we're seeing, for example, people in Indonesia building globally, in the US, etc. I think some of the dif differentiators are what make a founder successful. Right. One, focusing on the problem and not the solution. Um, so, you know, founders who figure out that there's a problem that's experienced by a lot of people, and by a lot, I mean millions, not only in their country, but neighboring countries and other places as well. That's number one. Number two, the ability to very clearly enunciate and express their vision and why it's important and why it's now and why it's them. That allows uh, everyone to get on board. Uh, and three, the ability to actually get in, in, uh, investors on board. Jerry, um, you're, again, uh, growing the company very fast in the region, right? So what are some of the things that you're thinking about in terms of enabling the company's growth, in not just in Brazil or Mexico, but uh, in the entire region? I think the, the difference between building you know, a, a company or a great company and just a, a product is uh, that it comes down to also building a system where you know we might have an initial way that we interact with our customers, initial product that we start uh, we start them on, but ultimately you know we're building towards a vision, and so having that idea of like where we want to be one year from now, three years from now, even ten years from now, uh, and having uh, a sense that gets clearer and clearer over what are the steps that we need to take to get there, and be able to you know create the system, create the company, a community around it that is aligned on that vision, uh, and then you know making sure that you have the resources to make it happen. You know, first and foremost, uh, the team. Without that, you know, nothing is possible. Uh, and then you know, if in order to, to to get to where you want to, you need investment, and making sure that you you're properly resourced as well. Great. So I've worked with a lot of ecosystems around the world where there's a lot of founders that has a very local mindset and not really thinking global day one. And so really hard coding the business around that local market. And I see a little bit of a similar trend with Brazil and even the US as well, where the market is so big that obviously there's a market there to capture. And they're kind of forgetting about thinking global in that process that then prohibits international success in the future. Um, and so what, what are some of the things that you've seen in your work that, um, that particularly have these traits in terms of for teams to be successful in global markets smart? Yeah, I wanted to share some results from a research project that we recently concluded. Um, between 2015 and 2018, we surveyed 34,000 entrepreneurs um, around 20 minutes of their time um, in order to really create 80 metrics, um, how they're doing on talent and how they're doing on fundraising, et cetera, et cetera. And today we check how have each of these, these companies and entrepreneurs done, right? And out of these 34,000 companies, we've seen that 400 have become $100 million plus companies or scale-ups. 18 have become unicorns. And we tried to identify what are some of the common factors, some of the common behaviors that we've seen for these wildly successful companies. And it really comes down to three points um, that I found quite fascinating and actionable for entrepreneurs. The first is, you have a network of uh, mentors and advisors around you that you also incentivize with equity because you're really trying to bridge knowledge gaps, right? So that has served very helpful. Um, the second point was a global connectivity to top ecosystems and peers within these top ecosystems. And the third point was a high degree or a high share of outside of continent customers, meaning for Brazilian startup founders that they immediately try to build a global business model and go to the US and go to Europe very early on in the game. It was amazing to see how, you know, how much of an overlap of behavior uh, we found for these companies that have done extremely well. 
I agree uh, the founder co connectivity is incredibly important in, in an ecosystem, but I also see some unique challenges in other markets like Japan, as an example. The connectivity is there, but the conversation around challenges are not there. So they're not really sharing their struggles. And so they don't really learn from each other that much. They know each other, but don't learn. What are some of the things that you're trying to kind of foster that within Latitude to kind of create that sharing of learnings and challenges and successes to help not just that individual founder, but the community to grow together as well? There's two things we identified um, that are particular to founders in Latin America. First of all, not so founders in Latin America, but all founders. Being a founder is super lonely. You are often just having to figure out everything from scratch. People don't understand what you're doing. And having people around you who actually are going through the same journey is something that you can rely on when things are really tough. So that's something that we wanted to build. And we've built a community of 1,500 entrepreneurs wow. growing uh, selectively. Um, so that's number one. Two, in terms of Latin America, I, you know, I, I grew up here. And I think, like you said, often we think in our own countries. So a lot of startups were looking to mentors in their own country. So for example, or in their city. If I'm in Sao Paulo, I'm gonna go look for someone that's amazing at this in Sao Paulo. That's great and that person's probably amazing, but the ecosystem in Latin America is at least 10 years behind that of the US and there's, you know, there's, there's differences in terms of just the, the um, years of experience that the ecosystem has had. So having access to mentors outside of your country and in Silicon Valley, for example, where things are much more mature, can be a, a huge asset. So we built something from scratch where you, uh, as an entrepreneur, get access to top mentors, not just in Latin America, but also um, wherever they are in the world, the best of the best. Um, yeah. That's amazing. And Jerry, I know this question is not on the list here, but you've gone through the struggle many times before being a founder and also a growth executive, et cetera. What have you done actively to kind of learn from others as a founder as you've grown and scaled businesses in, in the region? Yeah, I mean, certainly the work that you know, Gina and Mark, uh, their organizations and, and others like theirs, like Endeavor, uh, you know, are a great asset to entrepreneurs. Um, you know, we want to learn uh, as much as possible from the experiences of others. And, you know, I think always having a group of, you know, whether we call them mentors or, or friends who are some steps ahead or have gone through, you know, similar challenges uh, has been very helpful. Uh, and in my case, too, you know, it's been a case of, you know, learning from my own previous experiences. You know, it's not my first rodeo, uh, you know, have done it before, you know, have tried to be very intentional about, uh, you know, filling any gaps that I think I, I might have in, in kind of my own, uh, yeah, you know, learning journey. Um, and, and, you know, surrounding yourself with great people inside as well, right? Like, ultimately, you know, there are folks at, at Clara, starting with my co-founder, co-founder Diego, who are you know, 100 times better at doing, you know, what, what they're a specialist in compared to, to what I could do. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, having those specialists, uh, you know, like you would when you're forming a, a sports team, uh, I, I think, and you can ultimately kind of work together better and learn from, from them. What are some of the communities that you tapped into to kind of get this feedback with other founders? I'm curious to learn more about that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's quite a number of them. I mean, like uh, Latitude is, is certainly an example, and uh, you know, Brian there has, has been a supporter and investor since the earliest days. Uh, the Endeavor community, which is very active across LATAM, really started in LATAM and now is global. Uh, I'm going to see some of those folks actually this weekend. Um, certainly, you know, our investors uh, tend to have very active communities, so uh, you know, definitely we tap into into those. For myself, and also something that ends up being really helpful is. Uh, you know, it can be also a, a difficult and, and lonely journey if you're, say, the CFO at a, you know, at a fast-going startup and, you know, you don't necessarily have a, a group of peers that you can go to or, you know, you're leading, you know, challenging topics as a kind of HR or people leader. And so having those communities form around these functional areas, I think, has been super, super helpful for our team as well. And that was one of the reasons why we want to write Global Class, because international expansion of growth is often a solitary experience. 
And so we wanted to go out and create that resource so we can build that community of people that they can learn it from each other, but also a playbook that helped enable growth globally. And so I'm sure you've gone that, through that experience as well at Duolingo. You probably didn't have that many to sort of share feedback with when you were leading expansion at Duolingo, Duolingo and other companies. No, I was going completely rogue. I, we I were just that. figuring it out as we went, so that's definitely an outlier experience. But one thing, you know, we were talking about policy in different countries and what I, you know, you just ask about entrepreneurship in Latin America, and I keep insisting entrepreneurship in Latin America is the same as in other countries. One thing that I found with Duolingo is that it, with international expansion is that focusing on the human need, so again, focusing on the problem, and not specifically on the human need of people in your country can be really powerful because humans are very similar. We think we're very different, but in fact, we are not. And so with Duolingo, you know, most people kept saying like, you need to localize, you need to understand how things work here, and you need to connect with local pe whatever, people and solve the problem for here. No, language learning is hard for a human no matter we, where you are. So we made very controversial decisions, like for example, not local, like we localized language, but like the platform was the same no matter what. And when we went and we launched in a new country, we would do it in the same way. Um, so I think that's something important to remember too, because when we talk about policies, it, I think makes the world feel very fragmented and like we need to take care of every country and region differently. But as an entrepreneur, it's very powerful to think globally from the mindset of I'm solving a human problem and I just need to go find humans who have this problem. And as quickly as you can do that and find those pockets of humans around the world that have that problem and that can access it from the platform that you've built, the more quickly you can grow. Fantastic. So I have one final question and we have two minutes left, so keep it a little bit short. but. What uh, didn't I ask you guys today that I should have asked when it comes to this topic? Each of you. I think one point that I like to share is that, you know, when we started the work on Startup Genome, we found that the amount of successful startups was really concentrated in a select few places only. Today we live in a world where 115 cities in the world have been able to produce at least one unicorn. When we look at how the exit value that has been generated globally is less and less concentrated in San Francisco, in Tel Aviv, in London, we're really on a good path to building a global startup revolution that works for every community around the world. And I think it's important for us to, to be part of that and for us to leverage the capabilities that are out there. Um, so that's, that's something that I wanted to share with everyone. Yeah. Gina? Well, my, my, my last message, I think, is if you are in Latin America and you're interested in being a startup founder, then come talk to us. Yes, being a startup founder is hard no matter where you are, but there are difficulties that are particular to Latin America, and we can connect you with people who can help you. Awesome. Jerry? The idea of like what's going to create even more momentum what's gonna, for the region is, I think, continuing to have more cases of success. Uh, and, you know, we stand, too, on the shoulders of giants, uh, and, you know, we're starting to see those companies complete full cycles. Uh, and I think it's important that we, as a community of entrepreneurs, continue to support each other. It's really important work uh, that the orgs here represented are, are doing. Uh, and hopefully we'll see a lot more successes in the region. would love for us to be a, one of those, uh, and that this helps inspire you know, more uh, people to take the plunge uh, to start something uh, for the excellent uh, folks who are joining companies like ours to join a startup and for more investors to come and invest in the huge opportunity in LATAM. On that great note, I would like to thank everyone for being here with us today and obviously the panelists as well. So why don't we give them a round of applause? And thank you for Web Summit for putting together an excellent conference. And thank you, obviously, to Rio de Janeiro for hosting it. And so we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.